The summer between my junior year of high school was, was the last year that I went to summer camp with Boy Scout Troop 1361 in Virginia. For years we had gone to Camp Shenandoah. It was a lot of fun. It was very familiar. But this year the troop went to Camp Goshen. Several of us were afforded the opportunity to go on a special backpacking camp that included all the different smaller camps within the larger Camp Goshen. 
It was called Len Hoxin Trail. My scoutmaster and several of my assistant scoutmasters were Marines who served in Vietnam. Taken from his experience in Vietnam, he gave us a PG-rated rendition of what he was told when it was time to get up, put on your pack, and move out. It was off and on, gentlemen. It's time to rock and roll. There was no discussion. There was no negotiating. There were no hurt feelings. Whether we wanted to or not, we got up, we put on our packs, and we moved out. It was time to rock and roll. As a group of veterans, I know that we've all received orders we didn't want to do. But our choices were do it or do it. <laughs> Ananias had a similar situation. He resisted. God won. But before we get into the details, context. The previous chapter, chapter Acts chapter 8, carries us forward, carries forward the heinous persecution that Saul brought upon the church in Jerusalem. This caused many believers to flee to other places. One of those believers was Philip, who had great success spreading the gospel in Samaria. God then directed Philip to present the gospel to an Ethiopian official who was traveling back home. And now we pick up with Saul once again, who was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priests and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. This young Pharisee, Saul, was so zealous about his beliefs that he was willing to persecute anyone who confessed allegiance to Jesus. Christianity was at that time referred to as the way. He had been raining down his terror on the way in Jerusalem and was now seeking endorsement to extend his persecution to Damascus. Damascus was a key commercial city, a junction of several trade routes going to many other prominent cities in the Roman Empire. Since his initial efforts to stamp out the way in Jerusalem were not successful, his next target was Damascus, hoping to head them off before the good news spread any further. Saul proceeded with his plan and set off for Damascus, 150 miles from Jerusalem. On foot. He was almost there. I can picture him a little bit foaming at the mouth. But then, verse 3 suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul. Why do you persecute me? Well, that's pretty much the, res the exact response I would have had. I too would have been on the ground. However, perplexed, Saul asks, Who are you, Lord? Well, let's not get too carried away by his use of the word Lord here. 
This time, he's simply acknowledging that he's speaking to someone greater than he is. I don't know how often you get an immediate answers to your prayers. Doesn't happen very often for me. Don't worry, Saul didn't even realize he was praying here. He's just asking a legitimate question. Who are you? Not only was there a bright light and a voice, but there was a person who spoke. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now get up, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. Roger, moving. Only one problem. Saul couldn't see anymore. We're told in verses 7 and 8, the men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. Now these men were likely the hired muscle Saul had brought with him. They would be doing the arresting and escorting those who belonged to the way back to jail in Jerusalem, 150 miles away. Talk about a forest road march. Instead, they were escorting a blind Saul by the hand into town. These men, the enforcers, the brood squad, if you will, but you are the brood squad, heard the sound, but they did not see it. Did they see the light? not the person in the light? Did they hear the words? Or did it just sound thunderous to them? We don't know for sure. But ultimately it doesn't matter. They were, however, witnesses that something happened on that road. Verse 9, for three days he was blind. And he did not eat or drink anything. Clearly, this put a damper on Saul's plans. He had not counted on anything coming between him and his objective, let alone the resurrected Son of God himself. I can picture him just sitting there, thinking, reevaluating his life choices in the darkness of suddenly being blinded by the heavenly light. Now, enter stage left, a new character in this wild adventure story. Ananias receives a vision. In this vision, this disciple is called upon by the Lord. And he replies, yes, Lord. I would like to point out the difference here between Ananias and Saul. Ananias knows who he's addressing. Yes, Lord. Saul asks, who are you? Now, some would say that Saul accepted Jesus as Lord on the road. I would argue that Saul's roadside experience was the introduction. At some point during those three days of blindness, as he sat in darkness, 
is when Paul likely surrendered his life to Jesus as the Messiah. Back to Ananias. Verse 11, the Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him and restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I've heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with the authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. Now I'm just thinking out loud for Ananias. I imagine what he's going through in his mind. What he kind of says here is probably something like, God, that boy can sit there in his darkness for all eternity. I ain't going. Verse 15. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and to their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. God does not seem to be in a negotiating mood. He says, Go! Now Saul is a man who has zeal. He has fire. He has passion. He's willing to do what needs to be done to get the job done. This is exactly the kind of person God is looking for. We just needed to redirect him a little. But don't worry, he's not getting off scot-free. He will suffer for my name. Verse 17, then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, in the Southern Baptist Church, you can hear, Brother Saul. <laughs> Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's ears, from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And whether Ananias wanted to or not, went. Despite his understandable feelings, he obeyed God. We must not limit God. He can do anything. He can use anything. We must obey and follow his leading. Even when he leads us to difficult people. Now, who is a difficult person? And difficult places. Further, he addresses Saul as brother. I don't like what you've done. I don't like what you've done at all. But you're no longer my enemy. You're my brother. 
Ananias touches Saul. Something scaly falls from his eyes, and he can once again see. He was filled with the Holy Spirit. He was baptized. And he ate and regained his strength. I think the order of those things is a little interesting. He saw, he was filled. He was baptized. Then he ate. That's a minor priority, man. I can eat anytime. Let's get to business. Now, God is a very personal God. He works with each of us individually, He knows how to get our attention. And he uses that thing, or that person, or that media, whatever it may be. He speaks to me through those things. God speaks to me through scripture. But I've also received word from him through music, and movies. Sometimes in places where I really did not expect to hear. God has even spoken to me through a nickelback song. God knew that Saul was going to be a hard nut to crack. So he came to Saul in an unmistakable way. Nothing like a heavenly strobe light and a thundering voice to get someone's attention. Being instantly blinded so that you can finally see the truth. So what does it take for God to get your attention? Will you answer when he calls? What if God calls and asks you to do something you don't want to do? Like Ananias. God will let you voice your opinion, your side of the story. But ultimately, God's requests are not really requests. They're marching orders. For our good and for the good of those around us, we must comply. We must follow his orders. What blessings have you missed out on? What blessings have those around you missed out on? Hear. Listen. Follow, obey, let us pray. Almighty God, we thank you for directing our lives. We thank you for being intimately involved in our lives. Help us to see the wisdom of doing your will, whether we like to, whether we want to or not. Give us the courage to do the things you lead us to do.